The following stories have been submitted to me directly. Story 1 I think I barely escaped death, or at least something really, really horrible. I still have nightmares, and thinking about it makes me shiver. But here goes. Names change for privacy reasons. Me and my friends are from Minnesota. A few years ago, we all went off to college everywhere around the States. I think Emmy even ended up in Canada. We almost lost touch. Until Pete called us up, wanting to go camping up by Eagle Mountain. One more adventure back home before life had us drift apart too far. Asking me, I think that had already happened. But they were my friends and I was missing home. And the vacation came at a good time. My girlfriend had just gone on a break from me, and you know how that usually goes. Job opportunities were bad, and I was tired of looking. And I got excited at the idea of seeing Sarah again. She was my first crush, but Ben beat me to it. They were dating all throughout high school, but I don't know what became of them afterwards. The thought of her possibly being single alone made me forget about my relationship troubles real quick. In the end, I needed time away from where I was. And when I saw all of them together again, I felt like I was 16, sneaking beers out of Dan's father's cooler to drink in the Taco Bell parking lot, swinging in children's playgrounds until Pete threw up, trying weed with Ben and Emmy for the first time racing down country roads way over the speed limit with all of them after I got my license. We had good times. And they all came. Pete had us booked into a motel for one night before we would go up into the woods, so that we could arrive properly, rest and catch up with each other. All standing on that parking lot, it felt like nothing had changed. Emmy and I still had our inside jokes. Pete still wore that stupid brown leather jacket. Sarah was still beautiful. And Ben was still a pothead. Even brought some joints along for all of us. In retrospect, those might not have been the best idea. But we couldn't have known. And right then, I was more preoccupied with the fact that Ben and Sarah had arrived separately. And while amicable, were distant. No way they were still together. Oh yeah. Dan had lost the emo makeup. Still dressed all in black, though. We went out to a bar together, did some catching up. Everyone seemed to be doing better than me. Pete was even engaged to some girl he hadn't told any of us about yet. Dan had just landed a great position in his field. I was happy for them. They were my friends. We took off before noon the next day. We all had our own tents and sleeping bags. Emery bought some camping cookware that we split up between our backpacks, and we had enough provisions to last us five days, including a cooler chock full of beer that Dan refused to leave behind. Pete had laid a route out for us, through the woods, by some lakes that would give us some splash time, and halfway up the mountain. For the view, he'd said. He had the map. He knew where we were going, so he was up front, leading us through a pathless forest straight for the first spot he had chosen for the camp. I was walking with Dan on one side and Sarah on the other. We had really hit it off at the bar again. Dan, my best friend since childhood, and Sarah, my first high school crush. To think I had ever been okay with losing them to something so stupid as my own laziness. That's what it was. Plain laziness to pick up a phone and send a text. It didn't take more than that. And she was interested in me. In my life. She was asking questions, doing that thing with her hair she'd done back when she was flirting with Ben. Laughing at stupid stuff. Everything seemed perfect. We set up camp on a little clearing and made a fire. Emmy prepared a small meal for us, some heavenly stew she warmed up on her camping stove. And when we sat around the fire, Dan started telling us his horror stories. He'd always been obsessed with them, 
Myths and legends of man-eating monsters, ghosts and murderous beasts. This time, his subject of choice were wendigos. Gnarly things, stories that of Abjaiwe and Cree tribes that used to tell their children to scare them into being good and not go out at night. Because the wendigo spirit would possess them and turn them into greedy, cannibalistic monsters that killed without a second thought. So if I start stealing your s'mores, better shoot me right away, Dan had said with a wide grin and his hand formed into a gun shape, the fingers that formed the barrel pointed at his temple. Emmy almost immediately leant over and ate the molten marshmallow right off his stick. We laughed as Dan looked on in mock horror, dramatically declared her a wendigo whack, and demanded to shoot her. Small things you remember. I can still feel the crunch of my s'more when I think about it, how the warmth of the fire fell to my skin, or how Sarah stopped and nearly shrieked because she had stepped on a bone the next day. Some animal bone. It cracked horribly and crumbled under her step. Dan stopped to look for more, but Sarah wanted to move on, said it gave her the creeps. I see what she meant now. That second day was a hell of a lot less pleasant than the first one had been. It was hot. All of us were sweating, and just longing for that lake that Pete had promised us. And I had the weird, crawling feeling of being watched. A seventh pair of footsteps, just off enough from the rest of the group to be noticeable every once in a while. But when I looked around, there was nothing but trees, bushes, and sticks. Sarah noticed and asked me if I was okay. I put it up to the animals, not being used to being in nature, around the other beings that made noise and lived their lives. If only I had listened to my gut. It started getting weird when the sun started setting. Pete had us put up a camp in the middle of the woods. You couldn't even call it a clearing. A gap between a few trees, a patch of dead earth, flattened and dried out plants and a single fallen tree that Dan immediately claimed as his dinner seat. There was barely enough space for all of our tents and the campfire. But we managed, crammed together tightly, and everyone found their place. We were still good when Ben came along with the joints, lit before anyone could decline. We sat together and smoked, reminiscing about high school and the olden times. Pete was the first to start saying weird stuff. That he always wanted that teacher, Mrs. Rosenthal, or something. To possess her, not just sex. Dan came along with dreams of mansions, more cars than he could ever drive in his lifetime, and a woman at every finger. I started getting hungry when Emmy started talking about quitting her passions to make the big buck. Didn't really matter what she had to do. When I asked her what she wanted all that money for, she just shrugged. More money. Money to make more money. We laughed. Sarah wanted to be famous. She had always been quiet in school, the background type. But now she wanted her face plastered across the side of buildings. Wanted everyone to know her name. Scream it when they saw her. My stomach was growling at that point. Must have been loud enough for them all to hear. I felt like I was starving. And I had that gnarly feeling in my chest. Heat spreading to my head that didn't come from the weed. A want. A need for things that weren't mine. I kept eyeing Dan's tent, so much bigger and better insulated than mine. And Ben's backpack, where I knew he kept his new iPhone. Ben... Look straight at Sarah. He said something about wanting her all to himself. Back with him because she was his. He said he wanted to tie her up, put her in a locked room and to make sure she would never leave again. She barely reacted, laughed it off as if it wasn't one of the creepiest things she had ever heard. Maybe she threw something at him. I don't remember. I wasn't sitting with them anymore. I had gotten up, my stomach feeling like a goddamn black hole. Cramps that had my head spinning, shooting through me every other second. 
I was digging around our backpacks, crawling into my friend's tents to find every bit of food we had taken along, piling it up. Then everyone cheered, got up to join my hunt. We had a feast that night, ate until we were bloated and kept going until our entire four-day provisions were gone. Dan had gotten out the beers. We drank and ate and all had another joint, until we had nothing left. And still, with my stomach feeling like it would explode any second now, I was hungry. The sun had gone down by then. I could see everyone felt the same as me, but we had no food left. I got dizzy, nauseous from the amounts of food I had stuffed down my throat, and decided going to bed was the best option for now. The others joined shortly after. I heard the zippers of their tents closing and them rustling in their sleeping bags. Buzzed and as high as I was, it didn't take long to fall asleep. I woke up once a little later to the sound of someone throwing up. It didn't take long and I heard slurping and Dan grunting and moaning slowly. Thinking about it now, he must have been eating his own sick. And I felt jealous of him, hunger still strong deep within me. The other time I woke up was because I heard Sarah, right next to me, whispering my name. It must have been right in my ear. But when I opened my eyes, I was alone. I was still wearing my hiking clothes and had just gone to sleep in them. I called for her, quietly as not to wake the others. No response. Just when I was about to lay back down, I heard it again. Carter. At the time, I didn't notice how weird she sounded. Raspy, sort of. I just chalked it up to the booze and weed we had had. Now I'm not so sure anymore. I got up, left my tent. The fire was still crackling lowly, but other than that, the woods were silent. Weird now, but I didn't know enough about the woods to think about it then. My friend's tents were closed, including Sarah's, but I didn't think much of it. I was closing mine too, didn't want to come back to a raccoon getting comfy in my sleeping bag. Carter. This one was quicker. She seemed close enough. I looked around at the other tents and whispered back. What is it? I didn't want to wake anyone, especially not Ben. Not after what he had said before. I need you, Carter. For a moment, my heart skipped a beat. Of course, my drunk, drugged-up brain would take this sexually. I licked my lips, took one last look around, and then stepped out into the darkness to follow her voice. Foliage was cracking underneath my steps. Dry leaves, small twigs. Anything moving through this forest would be making noise, but other than me, there was nothing. Carter. I kept walking, but she didn't seem to be getting closer, and the further away from the campsite she led me, the more frustrated I became. Come on, Sarah, I don't have time for games. It's late and it's dark and who knows what's out here. Carter, here. This one, finally, sounded closer. I smiled, but in the midst of turning, something caught my eye. It was in the dark, in between the woods, blending in near perfect. Two orbs reflecting the bit of moonlight that found its way down through the treetops. I squinted to get a better look, took a few steps towards it. Eyes shimmering green in the pale light, a long slim face, big ears, and antlers. I was about to let out a sigh of relief when my foot caught on something. I tripped, fell, barely managed to catch my fall hands first. But what I landed on was soft and warm. Softer and warmer than the ground should have been. And wet, most of all. 
I turned up my nose. Sure, I had just fallen in some animal crap and had gotten back up to wipe it off on my shirt. Only then, I remember the phone in my pocket. I took it out, switched on the flashlight and shone it at my feet. Sarah was laying unmoving in the dirt. Her face was turned towards me, mouth open in a silent scream. Eyes blind, grey, dead. Her hair shimmering in the sticky red liquid that was now staining my hands and my shirt. Her skull bashed open on a rock. Her shirt was little more than shreds drenched in her blood. Her back ripped open by what must have been gigantic claws. I could see part of her spine through one of the gashes, maggots already wallowing in her flesh. A part of her shoulder was missing, teeth marks in the delicate skin. I stumbled back, my dinner already threatening to resurface, when I heard the foliage rustle in front of me. I looked up and shone my light at the thing. It was no deer. I don't know what it was, but not a deer. Its eyes lay deep inside their dark sockets. The face was mere skin and bone, one ear half missing. What I could see of the body, bony and starved, the rest hidden behind a tree too thin to conceal the length of a deer. Then it opened its mouth. Wide, wide up, revealed rows of razor-sharp teeth tainted in blood. Carter. It was Sarah's voice, sounding from the monster's throat, scratched and rough, echoing through the darkness between us. I had enough brains to bolt. I think I'd dropped my phone. Never found it. Never tried to go back. I got back to the campsite, footsteps that definitely weren't mine following so close I could feel it breathing down my neck. When I dashed past the fire, I knocked over the stack of wood we had collected. Maybe the only thing that saved my life last night. The dry branches were quickly gobbled up by the fire. It grew, lit up the forest around our camp. I fell into Dan's tent, fumbled for the zipper, but it kept slipping me from my bloodstained fingers until he opened it from the inside. The first look on his face was one of annoyance, though it quickly turned to shock when he saw me. I couldn't say anything not more than a stammer of Sarah's name. He pushed past me, wanted to go out there into the woods, into the dark, but I held on to his arm for dear life. Don't. It was the only word I could say for the rest of the night. The others woke up soon after, joined us, to keep watch for the wild animal, make sure no one else would get hurt even if one of us fell back asleep. I knew it was no animal. I know it was no animal. But it's all they wanted to call it. We hiked back the next morning, left half our stuff behind. We took the trail we'd taken two days to get here in less than one. Everyone was exhausted. I just felt numb. We reported what I'd seen. Sarah, and the thing. The police chucked it up to the weed and alcohol, so that Sarah must have been mauled by a bear. No bear talks with human voices. My friends said they heard me calling them, each one by their name individually. I hadn't said a word since I followed Sarah's voice. They sent out search parties, but no one ever found Sarah's body and I'm sure as hell never going back into those woods again. Before I continue to the next story, I just want to say thank you for choosing to watch this video, and I hope you're enjoying my narration. If you are, please go ahead and hit the like button, and if you don't already, subscribe to my channel. Also, please leave a comment on this video letting me know what you think of it. They really help with the YouTube algorithm and will really help my channel to grow. Story 2 my parents used to have a lodge up in the mountains. We would go all the time, especially during summer vacation. Spend the hot days in the fresh mountain air, go hiking, take Bo out on the longest walks, jog through the woods when the sun was just rising. 
The golden hours up there made for amazing Instagram pictures. My God. Probably the only thing I'm going to miss about that place. And I was always allowed to bring a friend. Usually, I would end up taking Robin, my best friend, since diapers, really. I say usually. We grew up in that place, partly at least. Used to jump around in the pool in the backyard every single summer when we were tiny. Got a tan by its side when we turned teens. Used to, because I am never going back there again. We don't even own it anymore. Sold it to some poor soul who didn't know what they were getting into. It was supposed to be mine someday. That was the plan initially. I would inherit it. I would have my graduation and celebration vacation up there. Would chill there with uni friends during spring break. That was our plan. Their plan. But there is no them anymore. My dad cheated. Took some girls to the lodge while he was supposedly on a business trip. Mum and I decided to take a weekend trip in the woods and found him on his trip with her. She wasn't even that pretty. I don't want to know how many more of these business trips he had. My mum took the lodge in the divorce. Out of spite. Wanted to take their little getaway from them. But she couldn't stand the thought of being there. When we tried to go later the same summer, she broke down crying at the front door. So, she started looking for a buyer. I get it, and I didn't want that thing any more after catching my dad in the act with some random girl. So, we got the house and we got Bo, thank God. I don't know what I would do without that dog. The story I'm trying to tell happened half a year later. It was winter, and we had never been up there in winter. But the lodge needed to be prepared for new owners and there was still stuff of ours in there. So mum decided to have one last family vacation. Me and her. All we had of worthwhile family. Make some last good memories in that place that broke ours apart. It was also the first time I didn't bring Robin. I still feel bad about it. She was all ready for a winter vacation. Wanted to be there for me because she knew I needed her but I'd gone with this other girl. New relationships, and I told her I would be bringing her along instead. Instead, not two. I could have taken both, but I figured Robin wouldn't be too happy third wheeling all week. She wasn't happy, of course, with being turned down. She had put off other plans, cancelled a date of her own to be with me, so I wouldn't have to be alone in that place. And then I told her I didn't want her there. I would have been pissed too, but she didn't talk to me until after I left. The mountain was snowed in, which was to be expected, but our truck had some serious difficulties dragging the trailer up the path. I remember my mum gripping the steering wheel so hard her veins were pressing out of her skin, but she wouldn't let me take over in her place, kept waving me off whenever I offered. And Katie, the girlfriend I'd brought along, clung to my arm as she looked out the window in utter awe. She almost looked like she had never seen a snowy forest before. Maybe she hadn't. City girl from the south, she was. It got worse the further we drove up the mountain. The snow became heavier, the white wall thicker. The truck's windshield wipers were really struggling. Sometimes I still hear the rhythmic electric buzzing, their rubbery scraping along the glass. I hear Bo barking, and then I hear the scream, this horrendous animalistic screech. My mum hit the brake so hard I almost kissed the back of the front seat. Katie screamed in shock, and then just stared at me. It had to be close, the animal, the thing, too loud to be far away. And then, it jumped across the hood of the truck. A horrible dull noise of bending metal and a shadow in between the fuzzy white outside. And then it shot into the woods. Bo started barking like crazy in the back, spinning in his cage and shaking the entire car as he threw himself from side to side. Katie was clinging to me more than she had before already. 
but I was staring into the forest. I had seen it, dashing away in the edges of our headlights. Antlers, one propped up ear and a starved body. And it stopped before it disappeared. Stopped and looked directly at me. Somehow, my mum managed to calm Bo down without getting out and started the car again after she made sure that we were all right in the back. Katie nodded for both of us and snuck her hand into mine, her fingers wrapping around mine. Funnily, at that moment, more than any others, I wished I had taken Robin. She would have made some stupid joke about suicidal wildlife that would have gotten my mind off those empty eyes. We got to the lodge about fifteen minutes later. I had never seen it like this before. In the summer, the wood seemed light and cosy. There would be plants raking their way up the walls, moss covering the stone base. It would be green and bright and golden sunrise would light up the roof. Now, the lodge was grey, dark and empty. There was a big window in front of the living room that let you see inside from out front. But instead of the cosy feeling I used to get when we arrived here, now I just shivered at the sight of the dark rooms. It already looked cold. And it was. Mum brought us inside and immediately dug out some heavy duvets out of a cabinet, handing us one each. It took a while until the heating really got going. We settled in as little as possible. After all, we were also here to pack up and spreading more stuff around wouldn't be helping that much. The first day we actually used for some vacationing. Mum bought up some of our old board games from the basement. I rather wanted to watch TV, but Katie said to unplug, to connect with family instead. So I complied. The second day we got some stuff done. We packed all the pictures into boxes. Mum hesitated for a long while while she picked up one of us all together. Me, her, Dad and Robin. And then she threw it out the open window. She was so calm about it, nonchalant almost. When I went outside to look for it later, it was gone. Not a trace, but the hole it had left in the thick snow where it landed. We burned the carpet that we had caught my dad out on in the back restored some comfort to the house for sure. The third day, something happened. Well, two things happened. We went on a walk with Bo, me and Katie. I wanted to show her the same route we would always take when we were little. Bo was having a field day, jumping around in the snow and digging through the thick white carpet while we were walking hand in hand, keeping each other warm in our company. We talked mostly about school, about our plans, about what we wanted later. She started talking of nice cars, a mansion and a pool, smiling brightly. University didn't seem to be a thing on her mind. Neither did I seem to have a place in her future. But money did. I brushed it over, instead threw the ball for Bo. He had been running back and forth between us and the forest in his ecstatic game of fetch for quite a while now. Until he didn't return. Even when I called, there was no sign of the pitch-black dog. I jogged ahead to look for him, ignored Katie as she called me. I found his ball untouched in the snow, paw prints going past until they turned into the forest. I heard him growling before I saw him frozen in a mixture of attention and timid tension. His eyes were fixed on something in the forest that I couldn't see. I called for him, but he didn't even do so much as turn his ears towards me. He was shaking when I touched his back, the vibrations of his growl rising up until he broke into a barking fit. Usually he followed orders, quieted down when you told him to, came running at the sound of his name, but this time, only putting the leash on him and dragging him away could get him to stop. But then he followed, whining and whimpering the whole way back to the house with his tail tucked between his legs. Katie wasn't happy I had left her behind. 
my argument that it was only a few steps was seemingly invalid. Still, the night when we were up in my room, she crawled into my bed. She kissed me, touched me until my mind went foggy with pleasure, and I slipped out Robin's name. Not my proudest moment. Katie freaked out, stormed out of the room and downstairs where my mum was reading in her armchair in the living room. She asked her to be taken to the bus station, just glared at me in the doorframe. But I didn't try to stop her. My mum looked at me, but didn't ask, got up and got her keys while Katie went to fetch her bags. I stayed in the living room as they left, trying my best to ignore the disappointed look my mum gave me before she closed the door. I heard the truck start up, thought far too long about the croaking of the snow when the heavy vehicle rolled over it, and then I was left in silence. My chest felt tight, my heart heavy, but weird enough, I was mostly hungry. So hungry, I felt like I was starving, like I hadn't eaten in days, when we had just had dinner two hours ago. Bo began barking when I opened the fridge. I turned to tell him he wasn't getting any, but Bo was not in the kitchen. He stood at the door, the same stiff but fearful stance he held in the forest before, barking relentlessly, just like he would when someone knocked or rang the doorbell. I called for him to be quiet, pulling box after box of leftovers out of the fridge, but he wouldn't shut up. I ate the food cold, didn't even put it in the microwave. I don't even think I grabbed a fork, just started shoveling fistfuls of spaghetti into my mouth, slurping up yesterday's dinner as Bo started jumping at the door. And then I dug into my mother's booze cabinet. It wasn't until I had finished my fifth glass of some spicy-tasting liquor that I got up and opened the door, shoving the dog out and closing it behind him. For a while, he was scratching at the door, whining and whimpering. Then he went back to barking, screaming his throat out. And then, all went quiet. I was sitting in the living room with a box of my mum's cookies when the silence hit. I stopped mid-bite, sat up, and leant to look at the door. Nothing. I swallowed, an odd feeling in my gut as I pushed myself off the couch. And then, a knock. I almost winced at the sound, freezing at the thought of who could be out there. I had already grabbed the baseball bat by the hallway cupboard when her voice came muffled through the door. Ash, darling, I forgot my keys, my mum said, bright and clear. Open up for me, would you? And again, she knocked. I let out a sigh of relief and was already halfway to the door. And then my phone started ringing. I pulled it out, checked the caller ID. Mum. I heard you, I'm coming, I said, taking a few more steps. But the call didn't end. I stopped and decided to take it. Mum, I'm on my way to the door. Sorry, honey. The snowstorm is getting worse. I can't drive back up in this weather. There's a motel down here. Will you be all right for the night? I froze. Like, actually froze. Like all my muscles locked up as I stared at the door. My mum wasn't here. Yet she knocked again. And her voice came through the door. But not through the phone. Ash, the door. Mum. What are you talking about? I whispered into the phone and clung onto the bat for dear life. I heard her say something. The connection cracked, buzzed, and finally broke off. My heart was damn near racing, pounding out of my chest, and I watched the doorknob turning slowly. I don't think I ever before or ever again dove for a door that quickly. My shoulder cracked painfully as I crashed against it and fumbled for the locks. The doorknob slowly slid back into its original position. For a few seconds, it was absolutely quiet. Then, a sigh and steps, backing away from the door. Every single hair on my body stood 
prickling on my skin. My fingers felt so numb they could no longer hold on to the bat. My head was spinning, and I could hear the blood rushing in my ears. That rushing is one of the first things that comes to me in my nightmares. I took a minute to breathe again, another until I finally dared to straighten up and peek through the spy hole. Our porch was white and empty, but there were footprints in the snow. Bows, and some that were almost oblong splotches, almost like shoes, soles without a pattern. My heart set out for a moment thinking about Bo out there, with whatever or whoever that was. For far too long I stared at the doorknob, but however much I wanted him back in, I couldn't bring myself to open it. I backed away from the door, let out a shaky breath and snuck back towards the living room. I found my way back to the bottle of whiskey I had stolen, picked it up and brought it to my lips when something moved in the corner of my eye. I swear to God I stopped breathing for a whole minute. My eyes filled with water before I could move and I... I'm not proud to say it, but I peed my pants a little. It moved again and something knocked against the window front. Rhythmically, but dull, like wood hitting glass. I wanted to turn away, tell myself it was just a branch moving by the wind. But my buzzed mind was really looking to traumatize itself even more. Empty eyes. Empty bloodshot eyes and sockets as big as craters that stared directly at me. A head sat upon a neck, twisted whole to face the glass. The long, fallen in and starved face of something that looked as much as a deer as it did human was pressed up against the window, mouth fallen open saliva freezing at the glass, and it had antlers rising out of the dark fuzz on its head, in between the long ear and its maimed counterpart. They kept knocking against the glass as it moved its head, nodding slowly in sets of three. Knock, knock, knock. Again, and again, and again. I bolted, locked up in my room sleepless until my mum came home in the morning. I tried calling Robin a few times, but the signal was dead. Bo came in beside her, shivering. Clumps of snow stuck in his fur, but alive. Mum gave me an earful. About the dog, about the bottle of wine she found on the living room floor. I never told her about what I saw. Never told anyone but bawling my eyes out in front of her was enough to get her to drive me home. She would pay someone to get the rest of our stuff, she said. When we went out, those footprints were still barely visible, and the picture my mum had tossed was sitting by a tree, facing the front door. I don't think she noticed. We drove off, never returned. And I am honestly happy to never have to see that place again. Thank you for watching and or listening to this video. Again, if you enjoyed it, please go ahead and hit the like button. And if you don't already, go ahead and subscribe to my channel and select the notification bell so you don't miss out on any of my future uploads. Also, please leave a comment on this video letting me know what you thought of it. Comments really help with the YouTube algorithm and will really help my channel to grow. If you have a story you would like me to narrate, please email it to me at stories at daredeveril.com. I've recently passed 60,000 subscribers to this channel, so I'm on my way to my next major milestone. A big thank you to everyone who is continuing to subscribe to this channel and contributing to its growth by liking videos and leaving comments. Once I get to 100,000 subscribers, my plan is to reward you all with an epic video with over three hours of original content. If that is the sort of thing you want to hear, please help keeping this channel to grow. If you want to support my channel even further, there are a number of ways you can do so. You can consider leaving me a tip for this video via my PayPal. Link is included in the description. Check out my Teespring store and consider purchasing one of my shirt designs. I have a design with a dogman, a wendigo, a skinwalker and a bigfoot, all on a zebra crossing. It's a must for anyone who's into these types of stories. Some people have been asking in the comment sections if I have done any audiobooks, and the answer to that is yes. On Audible, there is a book Punch by J.R. Park that I narrated.
I do get a small royalty if you decide to purchase that. It's a revenge slasher horror novel that was a lot of fun to narrate. Thanks again for watching.